All right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, so we're coming AI. We shipped this uh, last week. It's called OpenPilot. It's freely available on our GitHub. It's an open source alternative to Autopilot, and we'll get to what that means in a minute. Next slide. Um, this is the comma Neo, which is the hardware that can run OpenPilot. You cannot just take your car and install OpenPilot on it. There's no processor in your car that is powerful enough to run it. A lot of the processors in cars are not very powerful at all, except the new Tesla Model S is now, I believe, shipping two um, Tegra X1s. So there might actually be a way, uh, if you are sufficiently a uh, hacker inclined, to actually run OpenPilot on the Tesla without any additional hardware, which would be really cool. But um, yeah, most cars do not have a processor powerful enough. So we uh, open sourced a robotics platform called the Common Neo, and we'll get to some more about that later. Uh, so these are the two cars that are supported right now. If you go out and build this, put this together, you can put this in your car. We drove down today in the Acura ILX, and this seriously did 50% of the driving, and it could have done way more if I wasn't scared to power cycle the car because the battery died. Um, the highway it can do almost flawlessly is on El Camino. El Camino has cut-ins and weird stuff that it can't quite handle yet, but new versions coming soon. Um, so hit it, and we have, this is just a short video of it working. Press it one more time. Uh, this is just a, uh, there we go. Um, so this is just a short video of it working. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is what it looks like if you build this, put it in your car. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about machine learning at Comma. Machine learning is the technology that makes this all possible. Uh, so to collect data, uh, we have 50 terabytes of internal, sure we don't have a clicker? <laughs> well, well, the problem is like, hmm, maybe we had a string and I tugged on the string and then, <laughs> um, yeah. all right. Um, uh, uh, All right, uh, so we have um, over 50 terabytes of data that we collected internally uh, using our car, similar in quality to the Udacity data. Uh, we have 600 plus thousand miles of data from our uh, dash cam apps, Schiffer and... Um, so we're continuously adding the data that comes in from our apps to the pool of data that we use to train our models, and there's no human labeling involved. We use temporal information to automatically ground truth all of uh, the stuff, right? Um, cars move, trees don't. That's a way to tell the difference, and it's very easy uh, using like structure for motion algorithms to tell um, you know, like the boundaries of an object and, well, like I said, some objects move, some objects don't. So we have a pipeline which labels everything automatically. Um, what we learn, we learn a, a CNN uh, coupled to an RNN. One guy at a track day once, once asked me, yeah, but which order are they in? I said, so you put the RNN first, right? Put the RNN on all the pixels and then the CNN. Um, we go from the images to a feature vector. Um, and then we go from features to target distributions, and we decouple the temporal aspect from the image aspect. And the reason that you have to do this, um, and maybe some of you discovered this with challenge two, if you actually try to run those models on a real car, you're gonna get into these bad feedback loops. Um, it's, it's very hard to train using, this method is called behavioral cloning, basically train a neural network to behave like you've seen humans behave. It's very hard to get behavioral cloning to not end up in weird feedback loops, because when it trains, its output does not affect its next input, but at test time, it does, because it's actually uh, running a dynamic system. Uh, this is the output of Vision D, which is the binary and open pilot that actually ships one of our neural models. Yeah, we actually have a model running. So this is a one plus three smartphone. Uh, we have a model running on the, uh, the Qualcomm Snapdragon 820. It outputs, it's very simple. It outputs a bunch of points that it believes lie on the path a bunch of points that it believes lie on the left lane, the right lane, and then a visual estimate of the lead car. Um, we do most of the lead car stuff using the radar, but um, the Tesla truck incident was because the radar filtered out the truck as stationary, right? And that's, that's, that's what happened there. The radar filtered it out as stationary. Elon posted on Twitter that he thought it, uh, you know, it mistook it for a uh, overhead highway sign, right? Uh, 
So that's why we have our vision model output a lead car as well. And then what you can read in Radar D and OpenPilot is the fusion we do. It's not that great. There's a whole lot of room for improvement. But um, yeah. So let's talk about the common Neo. That's the actual hardware that runs this thing. Um, what is it? Well, it's a smartphone. The modern smartphone, really, have you noticed how much more and more smartphones start looking like humans? I mean, they kind of are, right? They have, they have like little microphones and some you know, sensors to sense this, and they have you know, some cameras so they can see, and they have some, some light sensors. You know, there's two pathways to your eyes into your brain. One of them's a light sensor. Um, you know, look, they look more and more like, like humans. Um, so smartphones are, are incredible. Uh, we connect it to a CAN interface board. All the designs are freely available on the internet. That's the bridge that actually connects your smartphone to your car. Uh, we have a thermal solution because smartphones are not designed to run at 100% uh, CPU. Uh, they overheat and then they throttle down. Uh, I, literally, Android specs are just a race to get the best thing on Geekbench. Uh, some of the phones even have a if Geekbench, don't throttle as aggressively. Um, because the phone gets hot in your hand. Uh, so we have a thermal solution, not that great. We stuck a bunch of heat sinks on the back of the phone, uh, made a fan go into the heat sinks, but it's something. Uh, and then we put in a 3D printed housing, and that's Neo. Uh, we have a great guide put together. Uh, a friend who works at a big tech company, he's like, this is the nicest documented build I've ever seen. Um, we have a guide, uh, a hardware guy, Eddie, put this together. Really nice job, looks kind of like an Ikea furniture guide. I, did I say, did I say it'd be easy as a piece of Ikea furniture? Um, so these are some of the steps from the guide. These are the schematics of that board. This is the breakout cable that actually connects. Um, so the Common Neo has an ethernet port on the back of it. And you can connect this to all sorts of things. ODB parts, golf carts, Honda Civics, Acura ILXs, um, all sorts of things. Uh, how to test the board. And yeah, um, so these are the suppliers. Uh, you can build a common Neo if you just place six orders. Place six orders to these very common suppliers with the stuff we have on the internet. Um, it's designed to be built by anyone who can shop online and use a soldering iron. This is the common Neo. This is a spinning common Neo. At TechCrunch, I said the difference is shipability. The difference with the common Neo is buildability. Um, you can build this in a, you know, a tech shop's gonna have everything you need. Uh, open pilot. Um, so that graphic that I showed you earlier was actually the autopilot graphic. Our uh, uh, design team doesn't have as much of a budget. <laughs> um, open pilot is the code which actually drives the car. Uh, this is, so we have in the internal version, we'll be shipping it very soon, this is a car abstraction layer. If you want to add support for your car to OpenPilot, you're going to need to find these things. And uh, someone earlier asked about the CAN buses. All these things should be available on the CAN bus of a car. Basically, the speed of the car, the four wheel speeds, uh, the gas, whether the gas is pressed, the brake, whether the brake is pressed. Um, steering wheels are a little bit different. They usually have uh, a torque sensor, which is what the power steering system actually uses, and then an angle sensor, which is what we close the loop on in our PID loop to drive the steering wheel to a certain position. Um, and then the cruise uh, control, whether the user's pressing buttons, but very simple stuff and should be fairly easy to find on any modern car. Um, this is a little harder. This is the packet that you actually have to send to control the car. Uh, so you need to figure out how to control the gas and the brake and steering torque. Um, not all cars let you control the gas directly. You can tap into the cruise control system if you want to uh, use the gas. Even very old cars that all they have is electronic cruise control, you might be able to get a common Neo to behave as a adaptive cruise control that only hits the, uh, that only takes its foot off the gas. And you can actually do a decent amount of highway uh, longitudinal control with only that. Uh, controls D is the software, is the main control loop running the car. It has four parts, adaptive cruise, which is there's a car in front of me, what should my speed be, basically? And how fast, what acceleration should I use to get to that speed? Um, then we have a longitudinal control PID loop, which actually does and, you know, which actually carries that command out. We have a path planner, which talks to vision D. What line do I actually follow? It's very simple. It kind of just takes a weighted average between the two lanes and um, 
filters in the path prediction. And then we have a lateral control, which actually goes and does this. If you want to be here in 20 meters, turn the wheel this much, PID, close the loop on the steering angle, and that's how that works. Um, Kamei is the android of self-driving cars. We want to build out this platform to support as many cars as we possibly can. More and more cars are going to ship with the stuff that we actually need to make this happen. Um, adaptive cruise controls let you command the brake. Lane keeping assist systems let you command the steering wheel. We want to, oh, and the software that drives a lot of these on the cars is really low quality, except for Teslas. We want to provide better software to all the other manufacturers, even if the manufacturers don't want to buy it, even if you want to buy it as an aftermarket accessory, we're willing to work with aftermarket manufacturers, with dealerships. Smaller manufacturers have been receptive. Um, yeah. And as far as Nishta goes, um, let's change the safety conversation from legal threats to pull requests. Here's the thing about lawyers and regulators. Lawyers and regulators can only prevent a bad thing from happening. It is only engineering and technology and things like that that can actually make a good thing happen. So instead of just trying to stop people from doing things, if something's unsafe, write it better and submit a pull request, right? And that's how we can really move self-driving cars forward in a very fast and very safe way. And you know, one of the big concerns of the regulators is like, you know, what if one company gets into an accident and then doesn't share their data with the other companies and then future accidents could have been preventable? Why don't we just develop the whole thing open source? Um, so that's who we are. That's Comet AI. And I'll take questions. So you have uh, open source, comma, you have open source software, right? Yep. And uh, last time I checked on GitHub, the CV and ML stacks or blobs, are you planning to release those as well? Or did I look wrong? Um, are we going to open source? No. <laughs> no. Um, so when you think about like what Tesla Autopilot is, uh, Tesla Autopilot uses a CV ML blob as well. It's called Mobileye, um, or at least the old one did, right? Uh, so you can think of Vision D a whole lot more like Mobileye, and an automotive spec, think of it as like a QM part, right? All of the code that actually controls the car and all of the safety critical decision making code lives outside of Vision D. That's what's freely available, and that's what will let people port it to other cars. Our business model, of course, is to provide the machine learning to own the data and to own the network. Um, so I got um, one of those phones, and I got Coma AI installed on my phone, um, and I submitted a bunch of issues and pull requests to the GitHub. Yep. But um, I wonder if I can have the rest of the hardware from you, since you have a company that has a lot of them. And the other question that I have is, I wanted to make changes and, and try to see what happens, because I, I need to create a Vision D replacement, because I don't trust one that doesn't come with the code. And um, I wonder if I can have access to your data, and if all of us can have access to your data to learn. Um, so, OK. Uh, with respect to the hardware, our Kama AI can't give you any hardware. We don't sell products. We only move bits. We don't move atoms. Atoms can be regulated. Bits, I mean, they can try. Right? Uh, you can go down with the Liberator on Pirate Bay. I don't even know if I'm allowed to legally say that. Um, with regards to uh, giving you the data, so Comma AI has open sourced uh, seven hours of data. Um, Udacity has open sourced a big chunk of data. You're absolutely welcome to make your own Vision D replacement. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of open source data out there. So, so there's opportunity. Yeah, I know. So that's cool. I'll try to uh, open source my own data. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I, I recently bought a car, which is not a Honda, but yep. I, it has uh, the sensing equipment, and I do want to port um, what we have here to that. Sure. I read, um, this is a bit technical, that you said uh, in the documentation that below 18 miles per hour, the firmware for the car doesn't allow the autopilot to work. Can you please you know, talk yeah. about that? Um, so on the Acura ILX, uh, so on both the Acura ILX and the Honda Civic, if you go and build this yourself, um, it runs using the, uh, the PCM, the powertrain control modules, built in cruise control loop. Um, the thing about that cruise control loop is it doesn't work below a certain speed on the ILX. The Civic doesn't have this limitation, only the ILX does. 
Um, but yeah, the reason it, it, it basically disengages below a certain speed and then there's no way to hit the gas pedal again until the user gets above that speed and re-engages. Um, inside Comma AI, the way we address this is we built a gas pedal interceptor. We built a piece of hardware that actually sits on top of the pedal and virtually presses the pedal with analog to digital and digital to analog converters. We'll probably eventually open source that, but that is a whole lot more safety critical than everything else um, that's here. The thing about everything else that's here is it's designed to use the APIs that the Lane Keep Assist and the Adaptive Cruise Control already use on the car. So you get safety provided by the car's modules. If you start doing that with the gas pedal, um, you have to do it carefully, and that's why we haven't open sourced that yet. But um, yeah, we can certainly have a conversation about that. Also, which car? Uh, Mazda 6. Mazda 6, it might not have that limitation. There might actually be a can packet that can control the gas on other cars. All we've really looked into in depth is Hondas. I looked a little bit into Fords. They looked even more confusing. Um, but yeah, cool. So what further improvements needs to be made if you want to drive as good as humans uh, in rain and snow? And my second question is, um, let's say if we ever have self-driving drones, how do we actually localize them given that we just have GPS accuracy, which is not 10 meters or so. Yeah. Um, so with regards to rain and snow, that isn't the common use case of driving. Um, if you really want to, like the way I would attack a problem like this, don't try to attack the small, weird use case. Um, most driving and most fatal accidents, for that matter, happen when the weather is completely fine. Um, so, you know, uh, punt that problem. It, it's, it's probably, I don't see a reason why the camera can't do it. It was raining on the way down here. It works pretty well. Um, with regards to how to localize drones, drones are easier to localize than cars because uh, you're really 2D, right? So just take a picture pointing downward, send that picture up to a server and find a, a satellite image. Like find a match and then you can get probably a couple, a couple centimeters. What are you looking for when you are hiring uh, because you have a bit of a different sure. view than some of these car companies. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I don't care about your credentials. Uh, I don't really care where you come from. Uh, we look for two things. We look for intelligence and motivation. Um, yeah, I really, one of the biggest metrics to use is how many stars you have on GitHub. Um, kind of shallow, but if you have stars on GitHub, uh, that's a good sign. And then we look at your code. Have you written good code? Um, and then we do a programming challenge. Uh, do well on the programming challenge. We invite you in for a paid micro-internship, and then do well on the micro-internship, and uh, we offer you a job. But yeah, I, I think it's a lot different from how a lot of the, uh, you know, the tech companies uh, traditionally uh, recruit. I don't care what your GPA is. I don't care if you finish college. Hi, George. So uh, recently, there's been a big push for open source um, in a lot of fields, like Google open sourcing TensorFlow, and sure. most big companies have open sourced their machine learning tools. Um, why do you think there's been such a backlash in open sourcing self-driving car software? I don't think there's really been backlash. I haven't gotten any backlash. Uh, people seem generally supportive of it. Uh, I think that maybe, I mean, the truth is cars are dangerous, right? Uh, cars are dangerous, whether self-driving car or no self-driving car. Cars are just, just dangerous. Um, so maybe there's, 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 there's quote unquote backlash around that. But like I said, I haven't seen any. Um, I think open source is definitely the way forward uh, in self-driving cars. I mean, I think that's, you know, it's a big problem and there's, there's a huge pie to go around if we actually get this technology built out um, to the point that for one company thinking they're going to own the entire vertical, some companies even think they're gonna own the vertical to the point that they're making the car, they're making the self-driving, they're owning the ride sharing. I don't wanna own a vertical. I want to own a tiny horizontal. Let everyone else own the other parts of the vertical. So, do you see uh, do you see the bigger companies open sourcing their, their <laughs> things anytime soon? Not until they majorly change their cultures. I also don't see themselves in self-driving anytime soon. Um, my money is on three companies to solve self-driving cars. None of them are common AI, unfortunately. Maybe, maybe we'll win. But um, realistically, the leaders are probably uh, Uber, Google, and Tesla. They all have their own sets of problems. Uber makes no money until they uh, get to level four. Can Uber continue to get capital for five more years? Um, Google, I mean, it seems like most of them, most of the people bailed and joined auto. Chris Ermston left. Um, now they have a car company CEO running that, so uh, yeah, who knows there. Uh, their tech is good, though. Um, and Tesla, of course, I mean, I think Tesla is really uh, number one in the space, but I don't see them licensing their technology for other cars besides Tesla. Apple. 
uh, builds iOS in order to ship more iPhones. Tesla builds autopilot in order to ship more Teslas. There's certainly room for a player like Comma AI to come in and, uh, you know, get the 80%, get the, uh, yeah. Um, I'm very curious about the hardware, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, Tesla is a media solution, which is very expensive. You mentioned your hardware is cheap. So how do you make it cheap and powerful at the same time, which also can meet the automotive standard? Well, okay, so meeting the automotive standard is a whole different thing. Um, meeting the automotive standard only applies, again, if you're trying to sell a product. We're just doing open source stuff. Um, and even then, it's unclear whether some of those standards... You need, some of your parts need to meet a certain standard, but if you classify them as like QM, like the vision system, which is what you'd be running on the NVIDIA chip, then it's kind of less important for that chip to be uh, automotive grade, as long as the chip that's actually making the final decisions um, is automotive grade. And basically you have, you know, you write your code in such a way that no matter what garbage the first system sends, the system still behaves um, within acceptable bounds. Uh, but NVIDIA's chips are, are, they're not that expensive, actually. That's a, uh, the, the chip that Tesla, I believe, is using is the, uh, the X1. Um, there's a chance they're using the next generation, but if they're using the X1, X1s are available in the $200 NVIDIA Shield TV, which is a great piece of hardware to hack. We almost shipped on a Shield TV, um, but it doesn't come in a case that's so beautiful that has an LTE modem in it, too. You gotta get that data back, right? Um, it's uploading data right now, by the way. Uh, we have 79 minutes of data pending. Um, it's, uh, but yeah, um, so yeah, automotive chips, eh. someday, someone will need to worry about that. Not quite yet. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for bringing openness to a very closed system. Cool. Uh, do you have a running list of problems or bottlenecks that Comma doesn't plan to uh, sort of solve and for other people to jump in and contribute? on this like other layers of the whole stack that you see coming out? Yeah, um, so there's the, there's the whole stack from a perspective of like, the, the actual code that drives self-driving cars is a fairly small part of what I call the whole stack, right? So other parts of that whole stack is who makes the physical vehicle, right? Um, other parts of that stack is who owns like the ride sharing network or who owns the, the dealerships, right? I want out of that part, I want out of that part. I want to own a small segment of the horizontal. Um, with respect to what our code actually does and how to contribute to that, the absolute best way and what we expect, what we really hope contributors will do in the next year is add support for other cars. Um, that's the big one because the more, the more breadth we can get uh, out to this, um, the better, you know, more support, more users. We love users. Hey, George, how are you doing? Andre from Connected Car San Francisco. Great pivot and a question for your business side. Yeah. Who do you see as Comma's customers in 12 months, 18 months? Is it tier ones? Um, so our goal is to own the data and to own the network. Uh, there's a whole lot of products that, uh, I, I haven't announced anything business-wise yet, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but there's a whole lot of potential ways to go that don't involve the kick down the door and try to sell self-driving car software to OEMs, um, this doesn't work. You know, I met with a lot of the car company CEOs last year, and good luck. Um, good luck, and if you did, even if you did, even if they loved you, even if they really wanted to ship what you had, they're still thinking in terms of a five-year product cycle. So your thing's gonna ship in five years. I'd like to solve the whole problem before then, so. Um, other ways to do it. We, ha we haven't announced basically what the business model will be yet, but I have ideas. George, we should sure. end it now, if that's okay. Cool. So we can just keep on timeline. Cool. I'm so sorry for being the horrible person on this. Thanks so much, George. That Thank was you. really good. Thank you.